Good morning, everyone, and you're very welcome to our church service this morning. I must say, it's really thrilling. I mean, this is the last weekend holiday of the summer, and yet we have a wonderful congregation with us in Trinity this morning. So you're very, very welcome, uh, and it's good to have you. I've just one announcement um, to make. Uh, from the Trinity Ladies. Uh, they're not meeting formally, I hope we're getting this right now, they're not meeting formally uh, in their group until after Christmas. That's the plan at the moment, but it's being kept under review and may change. All right. Welcome also to those who are listening uh, online at home uh, or watching it on the computer screen. We hope that you'll enjoy the service and find a blessing. So we are here this morning to give God our thanks and our praise. So it's in the words of the psalmist, let us shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And this is the most wonderful verse that I love in this psalm. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So let's worship now as we listen to our praise group and we thank them for all the work that they have done over the week recording these songs. It's Trinity Praise number 166, Purify My Heart. Father, we have come into your house this morning to offer you our worship and our praise. For your love is unending, 
your power and your mercy limitless and your grace unbounded. You alone are worthy of all our praise and worship. You dwell in glory beyond our imagining, in light unapproachable, and yet you draw near to us. As we journey through life, you are traveling with us every step of the way. And we praise you for that mystery of your grace. And we are lost in wonder, love, and praise. But Father, as we contemplate your greatness, we also feel ashamed before you. We recognize that we have no right to be here except that through Jesus you bid us to come and assure us of your love and acceptance. Forgive us that we take your grace and mercy so lightly. So often we reject our Christian discipleship and neglect each other's needs. We need your forgiveness. We need to be made new. Help us to grasp the amazing truth that even now, despite all our feelings, your grace is for us. And so we want to thank you for your unending love and your constant faithfulness to each of us. We thank you especially for Jesus, for the example of his life, the truth of his words, the wonder of his death and the power of his resurrection. We thank you for our church and our place within it and for the members of our church who have shown to us by their living and their dying your renewing and transforming power in human lives. Accept our thanks, Father. Accept our love for you and our lives dedicated to you as you lead us onward on our journey through life. Continue your renewing work in us. These prayers we bring in the strong and precious name of Jesus, who also taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen choosing a king a long time ago in Israel, God chose a new king. The story is found in the Bible in the first book of Samuel. God didn't choose the person everyone else thought he would. One day God spoke to Samuel and said, Fill your horn with oil and go to Bethlehem. There you will find a man called Jesse. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Samuel went to find Jesse. Call your sons together and we will make an offering to God, he said. One of your sons will have God's blessing today. Show me which son to choose, Samuel prayed. It is not being the most handsome, tall or strong that makes a good king, said God. I look for a good and honest heart. Samuel looked at each one of Jesse's sons, but not one of them were God's chosen king. Do you have any more sons? Samuel asked. My youngest son is just a boy and he is looking after the sheep, replied Jesse. Send for him straight away, Samuel told him. We won't sit down to eat until he gets here. As soon as Samuel saw David, God said to him, this is the one I have chosen to be king of Israel, because I know how much he loves me. Samuel poured the holy oil in his horn onto David's head to show he was God's chosen king. 
God's spirit was with David from that very day. God knew David loved him and was the right person for the job. Let's remember this week that instead of being worried about what we look like and what people think of us, it's more important to love God with all our heart. As it says in the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. For people of every age, every race, every kind. To God, all people, you and me, are important. And he offers his love to you and me and to everyone. So remember in times when it's easy to be anxious, God cares for us all. And there's a place in God's kingdom for each of us. There's a place in the choir. Amen. And we thank Louise for coming to read now our gospel message from Matthew. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 15, reading verses 1 through to 20. Clean and unclean. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honour his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are, fa are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their, teacher, their, their teachings are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull, Jesus asked them? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean, but eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Amen. Thank you, Louise. And it's in confidence and love that we bring to our Heavenly Father now our prayers for our world, our community, and for ourselves. Let us pray.
loving God and Heavenly Father, give us, we pray, the eyes of faith that we may dare to see your world as it really is, that we may dare to see one another's needs, that we may dare to see with Christ's eyes and to follow him with all our lives. And so we pray that we may not be blind or shut our eyes to the suffering of your world, suffering brought about by injustice and oppression, by violence, warfare, torture, deceit, and lies. Especially this morning, we're encouraged to remember our Methodist churches in that great country of Upper Myanmar. And so we want to pray for all the ministers, leaders, and members of those churches as they seek to build your kingdom throughout their often troubled land. Lord, grant them wisdom and protection, and especially your blessing as they continue to serve, often in the face of danger. And then we pray that we may not be blind or shut our eyes to the needs of our neighbors in our own land. To those whose lives are filled with loneliness and anxiety, or who may be traveling through dark days of depression. To those living with the pain of bereavement and the burden of grief. To those living with the pain of bereavement and the burden of poverty and debt. And finally, for those who are suffering illness and pain, especially the young people that we know so well. May they know your healing touch and your grace surrounding them and their families. Finally, Father, we pray for ourselves. Teach us to rely on your presence and to see the signs of your glory. Teach us to replace hate with love, fear with knowledge. And help us to care for others as you care for us. Help us to remember that we are always surrounded by the incomparable riches of your grace. It is in the name of Jesus that we offer our prayers. Amen. I was very delighted when, when we were planning this service that Ivan volunteered to uh, preach the word to us this morning. And so we welcome him and welcome Ivan to the pulpit. Now we use that word volunteered loosely. <laughs> Good morning. It's, it's, it's great to be with you. And one of the advantages of uh, taking part at the front is you get to take your face mask off for a little while. <laughs> it's all a bit strange still, isn't it? Um, but it's lovely uh, to see everyone who's coming. Let's pray before we consider the word. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, to be worshiping you uh, together. And Lord, we thank you that we have your word. We thank you that we've heard uh, a story from the gospel about Jesus and Lord, I pray now that you would help us as we think about these things. Um, help us to hear Jesus' voice to us today, uh, and Lord, and to understand what you want us to do in our own lives. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, have you washed your hands this morning? We're getting asked this a lot lately, aren't we? It's not just children getting told off by their parents before they come in for tea. 
Even members of the government are asking us, have we washed our hands? There's signs, there's posters, there's adverts on TV, all telling us we need to keep washing our hands. Now, we know at the minute that this is very sensible advice. It's a hygiene precaution uh, to try and stop the spread of this terrible virus. And in the light of this, it means we would be very foolish to ignore what we're being told. Now, in the story that Louise read for us in Matthew 15, we find a strange confrontation. Pharisees and scribes have come to see Jesus, and they start complaining to him that his disciples are not washing their hands before they eat a meal. Now, these are not even local Pharisees. They've come all the way from the capital city of Jerusalem to see Jesus. And at that point, Jesus was way up in the north of the country, and it would have been about 80 miles that these men had traveled to see Jesus. It seems a long way to go just to complain about not washing your hands. So what's going on? Well, this is not the first time that Jesus has met uh, and come across Pharisees. They appear throughout Matthew's gospel as Jesus travels around preaching and performing miracles. And once we understand who they were, it's not a surprise that they keep popping up. So the Pharisees were men, and they were all men, who sought to promote religious purity and righteous living. Uh, You might be familiar with three well-known Pharisees who are named in the New Testament. There's the Sanhedrin member Nicodemus, uh, the Rabbi Gamaliel, and Saul before he became the Apostle Paul. Pharisees aimed to preserve and uphold Jewish traditions amongst the people in Israel and to try and keep Israel separate from all the outsiders, from all the Gentiles uh, around them. This was very challenging for them. If you think at that time, their country was under occupation from outsiders. The Roman uh, government was in control and there was many different cultures and influences uh, seeking to come into people's lives. So along with scribes and teachers of the law, they spent their time fastidiously studying the scriptures, trying to understand exactly how God wanted the people to live. They had a very strong oral tradition where they preserved and passed on the wisdom of the rabbis from years gone by. And it was all about protecting the people from breaking God's holy law. So now you can see why they were so interested any time a new teacher appeared in Israel. They felt it was part of their mission to make sure that the people were not being misled, to guard against uh, false teachers. The first time uh, we meet them in Matthew's gospel is when John the Baptist is preaching and baptizing uh, in the wilderness. And when John saw them, he was less than pleased to see them come. And with characteristic forthrightness, John never minced his words. He said, who who asked you to come, you brood of vipers? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There was a man who, who called a spade a spade. He knew they hadn't come because they were interested in the message he was preaching. He knew they hadn't come because they wanted to repent. They wanted to be baptized to show that they wanted spiritual renewal. They had come to check him out. They had come to make sure nothing false was being taught and he wasn't leading people astray. Now, Jesus first makes a mention of the Pharisees in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, He recognizes their aspirations to maintain these high moral standards. And he says to the crowd, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you certainly shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, on the surface, this may seem like an endorsement uh, of the Pharisees by Jesus, but actually it's part of a bigger point uh, that Jesus is making. It's a point about true righteousness and true holiness. He alone, he says, has come to fulfill the law and the prophets. He alone is the only person who has ever lived a sinful life. And he started to unpack 
the commandments and get the people to really think about what God meant uh, when he made them. Because very often, uh, all of us, the Pharisees included, will have a very narrow and legalistic interpretation of what God had said. As an example, he took the sixth commandment, which tells us not to murder. Very cut and dry, don't go out and kill people. But when Jesus unpacked that, he said that when God uh, gave us that commandment, his intent behind it was so much bigger. And God tells us, or Jesus tells us, that when God looks in our hearts, uh, and if he sees that spirit of anger, if he sees us um, calling our brother or a friend an idiot, a fool, or, or some other name, that actually that's the same spirit uh, that's behind murder. It's just when you get to the point of murder, you've taken it uh, a, a much uh, further distance. So he goes on to teach us about all these different commandments and actually how, fall, how far short we fall of God's holy standard. This is a rather hopeless message in a sense, but then he goes on again to tell us, well, that means instead of relying on ourselves to try and make ourselves presentable before God, we need to depend on him. And that's actually the very reason Jesus came was to help us to transform us and change us and help us to be the people that God wants us to be. Near the end of the sermon, Jesus said this, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. You see, it's not just what a person says or the facade that they put on for the world that gives the full picture about who that person is. Instead, God said, it's what's on the inside that really matters. And very often the things we do, especially in unguarded moments where we think nobody's watching, they're the really good indicator of what's actually the true state of affairs inside our hearts. It's so much more important to have the right heart, Jesus says. Now, as Jesus becomes more well-known, uh, as he travels around teaching and preaching, the Pharisees begin to watch him more and more closely. Things go downhill between them very, very quickly. The first recorded clash uh, in Matthew is when Jesus calls Matthew, uh, the tax collector, to be one of his disciples. Matthew's so excited about this, um, so blown away that Jesus would even think about him. He invites him home for a meal and he asks all his friends to come and hear Jesus too. The Pharisees are watching uh, from a safe distance because these are the sort of people they just do not uh, have any contact with because they don't consider them uh, to be the right sort of people at all. They don't want to become unclean. And when they get an opportunity, they pull Jesus' disciples aside and say, why is your master eating with these tax collectors and sinners? Does he not know who they are? Jesus' answer, he heard them, and his answer was straight to the point. These are the sort of people I've come to save. These are the people who need to hear about God's love. They need me. And he goes on to quote to the um, Pharisees from Hosea to remind them that God and in the heart of God is mercy and love and that's what he wants from people who seek to follow him rather than just mindless sacrifice and following rules. Now Matthew records a number of these encounters and the impression is that wherever Jesus goes the Pharisees are not far behind you can imagine how word of this new teacher has spread and how in their ranks a sense of alarm is beginning to grow as they see so many people are excited by what Jesus is teaching and are going out to follow him. They're worried they're losing uh, the people that they are trying uh, to protect. And very quickly they make up their minds about Jesus. He's not one of their number. He's not a Pharisee. He doesn't follow their traditions. He doesn't do the things that they do. He challenges them about some of the things they say. So they decide he's not right. He, he, he can't be sent from God. 
And at that point, they just close their minds. They're not willing to listen or understand what he is trying to say. Some of them go out of their way to find fault and just cannot see good in anything that Jesus does. One particular Sabbath day, Jesus and the disciples are walking through a cornfield. And as they do, uh, they pick just a few of the, the ears of corn and, and are nibbling them. Must be a bit hungry. I'm not sure how, how good that would taste. Um, but Matthew tells us that the Pharisees were there and they were watching. And as they saw it, they said, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. You see, in their interpretation of the law, there should be absolutely no work of any form done on the Sabbath day. And as they saw the disciples picking the, a few uh, ears of corn, they equated that with a form of harvesting. Then they said, well, then that must be work. Therefore, you're breaking God's law. In response, Jesus challenges them about the true purpose of the law and the priority about doing good over rigidly following rules. If you had known what these words mean, he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus then goes out of his way to demonstrate practically to them uh, what this means. He, he finds a man with a shriveled hand, a man who is disabled, and he heals him on the Sabbath day. But instead of being happy and praising God for this great miracle performed in front of their eyes, we're told that the Pharisees were absolutely livid and outraged about what Jesus had dared to do. We're told from that moment they decided that he needed to be killed. They needed to get rid of him. They went away and plotted how they might kill Jesus. That just shows how much of a threat they believed he posed uh, to the people. Now, after that, there's a few more encounters before we come to the one uh, that we have read about this morning, about hand washing. Now, hopefully, it's a little clearer now that over this period of time, the confrontation has been building. This isn't just the first thing they come in with uh, uh, about washing of hands. There were Pharisees right across Israel. It was sort of a national uh, movement. But the main leaders were in Jerusalem, which is the capital city. That's where the temple was. That's where the center of religious life in the country was. That's where the Jew Jewish ruling council uh, would meet. And I'm sure the leaders there had heard these reports about Jesus. And maybe it was them that sent and decided, we need to send a group north just to find out exactly what's going on. So they traveled about 80 miles, as I said, to go and meet Jesus. And if they'd heard the, the Pharisees in the north saying, this guy needs to be put to death, you could be pretty sure that they would want to find out. Just, let, let's just check this out, make sure, and, and we'll see what we'll do. But why did they choose hand washing uh, as their battleground when they came up to see Jesus? It seems a rather odd thing to do. Now, scholars tell us when Matthew wrote his gospel, he was writing to Jewish people, so he didn't tend to explain about Jewish regulations. He just kind of assumed that people knew all about them. So he didn't explain about hand washing because he just assumed you knew. But Mark, on the other hand, when he wrote his gospel, he was writing to people who weren't Jews. So even though his gospel is shorter, he tends to add in little explanations about some of these things that are a little um, to people like us, uh, unfamiliar. So in Mark 7, he, he writes this. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And then Mark adds this little note to explain. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of their elders. Mark goes on. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? So they've picked something that's actually 
one of their most basic everyday rituals, something that everyone is expected to do every single day in life, every time they eat a meal that has bread in it. And even to this very day, religious Jews still follow this uh, same tradition. Um, if you go onto YouTube when you go home, it's really interesting. Just search it up uh, and you'll find people explaining how you do it because it's done in a very particular way, a very careful way. Uh, and it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, I suggest you do that. But one important point we need to understand, which is maybe a bit confusing to us, is it's really nothing to do with hygiene. It's really nothing to do with cleanliness. It's all about this idea of ceremonial purity, of, of, of being clean before God. It's a symbolic action rather than something practical. And you'll find um, that if somebody had dirty hands, say they'd just come in from the field and they were working and their hands were dirty, they would wash their hands first to get rid of the dirt, and then they would do this. So it wasn't done to clean your hands. It was done as a, a symbolic act. Now Mark tells us it was a tradition of their elders. This was something that was distinctive uh, to the Jewish people, had been handed down from generation to generation. Now the Pharisees followed the scriptures that we call the Old Testament. But in addition to that, they also had this body of traditions which were called the oral law. And these were things that were developed by their leaders over the years as they read the scriptures and interpreted them and tried to work out, well, how do we do that? What does it mean? How could we best protect ourselves from ever breaking that law? And this extra wisdom uh, is really where this tradition comes from. There's no direct rule or law that we can find in the Old Testament that tells us about this ceremonial washing uh, for everyday life. The practice, we're told, can be traced back to the laws in Exodus 30, where the priests were asked to purify their hands and feet before they went into the tabernacle uh, to make burnt offerings. There was a big special bronze um, basin set up to allow them to do that. And that was ritual hand washing to make sure that they were ceremonial pure before the Lord, before they went in to do those things. Then we're told in Solomon, King Solomon's time, they decided to extend that. Uh, and as they worked uh, in the, the temple, they were allowed to eat some of the food that was given as offerings, uh, some of the meat. Uh, and they said, before you eat the meat, you also need to wash your hands. So that sort of got added in just to make sure that everything was okay. Then later on, following that example, someone else decided, well, it would be better if you washed your hands when you're eating anything in the temple. It doesn't matter whether it was meat or, or bread or based on grain or whatever. So that got added on a little bit later on. Then it seems later on again, some of the priests were being a bit naughty and weren't following the rule. So some of the leaders decided, right, what do we do to make sure that they do this? will make everyone wash their hands at every meal, and that means nobody will ever forget to do this. So at that point, and this is uh, hundreds of years before Jesus' time, it was made a law that everyone should wash their hands uh, ceremonial before they eat. And it was really all about protecting the priests. <laughs> so I hope you can see how some of these traditions developed um, and how they were maybe loosely based on something that was in the law, in the scriptures, but it was greatly embellished um, over time. And really what had happened here with the Pharisees and something like this, the tail was wagging the dog. The rule had come, become really a, a thing of its own right, uh, had become really important in its own right, and everyone had kind of forgotten even why they were doing it. The rule had become an end in itself. So Jesus, uh, when the, the Pharisees confront him with this, turns it back on them, and he shows them how doing this sort of thing and coming up with these traditions and sticking to them so slavishly um, and making them an end in themselves can really be a really dangerous thing in our lives. 
And sometimes it can even negate what God wants us to do. The fifth commandment is to honor your father and mother. And in those days, that included the idea of looking after them in their old age. If they needed something, you should provide it for them. If, if they um, maybe weren't able to provide for themselves anymore, you should take from your, uh, your money or whatever and help them out. But some of the, uh, the Pharisees and, and the religious people came up with a law that said, if, if you have money and you dedicate it to God, if you give it to the temple work, you can then say, well, because I've done that, I don't need to look after my father and mother, because this is more important that it's gone to God. And on the one hand, that is a really good thing. It looks really pious. You know, I'm giving my money to God. Uh, I'm supporting the work in the temple. But Jesus says, you know, as God looks at it, it's a terrible thing because they're actually neglecting what he wants them to do. He's actually neglecting this really important uh, thing to do in the family to look after each other. Uh, and maybe it's something done in secret, something that nobody else sees, but it's important to God. So Jesus calls them out for being hypocrites, for wanting to look pious while actually ignoring what God uh, wants them to do. He quotes some damning words from Isaiah 29. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And this is a terrible warning for us too. We can say we worship God. We can speak all the right words. We can even take part in a service like this. But the question is, what is the true state of our hearts inside? As God looks down upon us, he doesn't see all of that. He sees past it. He sees right into uh, who we really are inside. What is the state of our hearts? Do we truly love God? Are we in tune with his heart? Are we seeking to live a life that is pleasing to him? Or like the Pharisees have Traditions uh, got in the way, and have those things maybe become our focus? It just reminds us that we constantly need uh, to examine our motives in everything that we do. The Pharisees came to accuse Jesus. They had a big checklist of all the things he was doing wrong. But sadly, it was they who were missing the point. Next time we feel that spirit of criticism rise up inside us, next time we feel like pointing the finger at someone else, we need to make sure there's not 10 fingers pointing back at us. Pride, jealousy, uh, even a misguided sense of making sure we're being treated equally can disguise themselves under the cloak that we're, we're doing something good. Sometimes we don't even recognize that we're doing it. It just comes so naturally to us. But I think we, we just need to, at times, just stop and ask ourselves, why am I getting so annoyed about this? Is this from God, or is this uh, something else? Jesus, at that point, calls all the ordinary people to come around him. Listen and understand, he says. What goes into a person's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. Now, this is not a public health announcement, as I said earlier, about public hygiene. In all of this discussion, basic cleanliness is, is kind of a given. It, it, Jesus is assuming everybody knows how to you know, wash dirty hands and be clean. He's talking instead about this idea of being clean before God. And he's expanding it to not just when we're eating, but all the time. Instead, Jesus is warning, it's much more dangerous if you defile yourself with wicked thoughts, with wrong deeds, with having a heart that's not right with God. If you put all your focus on these external rules and trying to follow them, it's wasted effort when there's these much more important things to do. Afterwards, the disciples come to Jesus and say, do you know the Pharisees were really offended when they heard this saying? And Jesus said to them, I'm afraid it was unavoidable. 
In this matter, they were not speaking for God, and it was leading the people astray. If the blind lead the blind, he said, then both will fall into a pit. Sometimes you, you have to be, you, you can't be kind when people are, are really so far off the mark. Peter asked Jesus to explain a little more about what he said, as the penny hasn't fully dropped with him. This idea of, of, of clean, cleaning yourself before meals, it was so deeply ingrained uh, in their culture. Jesus answers, are you still so dull? Don't you see? Whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and out of the body. Just practical reality. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from their heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Those are physical manifestations of things that start off in here. Things that when people look at us, they don't see, but it's starting off, it's bubbling around, it's going around in our heads. Those are the things that truly defile a person. Eating with hands that aren't washed in a particular special way doesn't defile a person. So the real question this morning then for all of us is what is the state of our hearts? What is going on inside and really, that's one of the great themes that runs throughout all of Jesus' teaching. He wants us to see that we're fooling ourselves if we think that we can make ourselves acceptable and presentable before God by the things that we do. Because our standard of righteousness is just on a completely different page to who God is and what God expects. God who is completely pure and holy. We're quite good at comparing ourselves to each other, thinking I'm better than him and I'm better than her, but we're all completely on a different page to God. Instead, God wants us to be pure in heart by getting a new heart, by being transformed and living in dependence on him when we, uh, how do we get a new heart? We get a new heart when we believe in Jesus as our Savior. When we believe that God, uh, he was God's Messiah and that God raised him from the dead. When we ask God for forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong, for the thoughts that we've had in, in our hearts that are not right. When we welcome the Spirit of Jesus into our lives to help us and to transform us from within. It's only then that real transformation can begin and that God can help us to be the right kind of person from the inside out. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned three famous Pharisees in the New Testament, Nicodemus, Gamaliel, and Saul of Tarsus. And thankfully, there, there's a good story for each of them. We believe that Nicodemus became a follower of Jesus, even though he was a Pharisee and one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Remember the conversation that he and Jesus had, which is recorded in John chapter 3, one of the most famous conversations uh, in the scriptures. It's the same message. Jesus told him, Nicodemus, forget the rules. You need to be born again. You need to be changed from the inside out. You need to ask uh, me into your life. And he wasn't a proud man. He was honestly seeking after God. He had ears to listen. And by the end of the Gospels, we see him standing up for Jesus in front of all the other leaders. We see him taking Jesus' body down from the cross and helping uh, for it to be buried. Gamaliel was a leader in the Sanhedrin. We meet him in the book of Acts. And he's the one who warns the rest of the leaders about, uh, about acting against the apostles he warns, this, this just might be a work of God. This just might, and we could be found working against God. He was a wise man in saying that. Now, we don't know for certain, but Christian tradition tells us that he did become a follower of Jesus. Uh, and in the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church, they've actually even made him a saint, and there's a special day where they remember Saint Gamaliel. Lastly, then, we have Saul of Tarsus, um, a man when we meet him who is a Pharisee, and he is a vehement Pharisee. 
He is super zealous. He is trying to kill the Christians. He wants to wipe them out to get rid of this uh, new message. And what happens to him? He's on his way to Damascus uh, to, to get rid of the Christians there, and he falls off his horse as this great bright light um, blinds him, and he meets the risen Lord Jesus, and his life is transformed as he believes him in his heart, and from the inside out, he is changed, and his life is just switched around, and he starts preaching for Jesus. I wanted to end with that thought because it shows us that no one's ever too far away uh, from being able to invite Jesus into their lives. The Pharisees seemed like a lost cause, and a lot of them were because their minds were so closed. But there's three very important ones who became uh, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to bring a portfolio of good works from our past as a recommendation when we ask to become a Christian. If anything, Paul was ashamed of his previous life when he came. When we come to Jesus, we bring our lives, we lay them down at his feet, and we take up our cross and follow him. So in these days of coronavirus, we know it's important to listen to sound advice, to follow the right guidelines, especially true when there's so many experts in the media all telling us how they think we should act. Washing hands is good hygiene. I want to emphasize that this morning. We, sh we should all be doing it. It just makes sense. In the same way this morning, let's be wise in following Jesus' good sense, Jesus' good news, Jesus' teaching, and not be foolish and replace him with uh, advice from other people uh, about following this rule or doing that thing instead. Some things are helpful in their place, but other things just fill our time and make us feel a sense of achievement, but actually don't help at all. Having Jesus in our lives, trusting him as Savior, that is all we need. That is the vital way forward. That is um, the message this morning. The praise group recorded another song this week, which we're just going to listen to now, taking on that same theme. And I just ask you to listen to it prayerfully as we play it. And it's, May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. service. Let's turn and look each other in the eye. We're still allowed to do that at least and share the words of the grace together. For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.